and we are now recording. So thank you everybody for attending this week's session for the policy and advocacy training. We are very excited to have you back. Um, a couple of housekeeping things before we get started. As I've mentioned on previous calls, if there are any calls or sessions that you are not able to attend, please just watch those sessions on the website. They're posted there once a week. And then let me know that you've done that and I'll count it as your participation for that week. Um, I know that everybody's got crazy busy schedules and especially with things like this, the Department of Interior um, National Tribal Broadband Summit going on this week, totally understand there's competing priorities. So those sessions are there for your perusal whenever you get time. We've also heard from many of you that um, you are looking for the additional resources and things like that. And I would remind you that those all live on the web page as well and we continue to update them. If there are any resources posted in the chat here during one of the sessions, we're doing our best to get those on the site as well. Um, but I ask for your patience as we work to get those up. As always, these are meant to be interactive sessions, so please raise your hand, wave in your Zoom, you know, comment in the chat, and we'll take questions as we go along and then have dedicated time at the end. So with that, I wanna say a huge thank you to our speakers today, Denise Williams, Crystal Hottaway, and Wayne Miranda. We are so excited to have you all on this session and look forward to learning from you. So with that, I'll turn it over to you and say thank you again. Oh, thanks, thanks, Katie. And um, so nice to be sharing virtual space here um, with all of you today. And uh, as Katie mentions, you know, I know everyone's got uh, a lot of competing priorities and all of which are probably on Zoom. And so hours a day in this kind of environment I know is tough. And, uh, you know, thanks for your interest and, and thanks for coming in and being part of a community here today. Uh, my name is Denise Williams. I'm from Cowitzen tribes. Uh, in Cowitzen in our language, Halkuminum means the warm land or the land warmed by the sun. I'm from also, also known as Vancouver Island, uh, British Columbia in, in Canada. Um, today I'm coming to you from tsleil uh, territories, which is also known as North Vancouver, and uh, really grateful uh, for that. We've been having some challenging uh, some challenging climate issues and a lot of smoke in the air on top of uh, a lot of challenges with uh, COVID. And uh, so just sending, um, just sending my, my thoughts and uh, good energies to all of you and your families and the territories you're coming from uh, today. You know, it's a, a challenging time for all of us. Um, I'm the CEO of the First Nations Technology Council. I'm going to tell you a little bit, just, just briefly about that, and um, share a little bit about uh, our journey. Uh, started with a $700,000 debt when I took over, and uh, no strategic plan or business plan, and not a lot of social capital, either from the communities we were serving or from any level of government. So this has been a really big turnaround effort to get the First Nations Technology Council to a place of influence in Canada, uh, in British Columbia, and uh, we've had to do a, a lot of fancy, uh, a lot of fancy footwork to get uh, uh, funding into our organization and out to our communities, specifically for digital skills development and connectivity. So, um, just going to share humbly a few things with you here today, and um, as. Katie mentions this is highly interactive and I'm always happy to be uh, stopped or to uh, uh, invite a deeper level of conversation on anything that the group is interested in. So um, please do feel free to do that now or even after the presentation, I, I would love to uh, uh, keep, keep in conversation uh, with, with all of you. So I'm just going to actually um, share a bit of the, uh, uh, presentation I have for you um, here today. Um, here we go. Sorry, just organizing things here around the screen. Um, so just ideas about building uh, influence and uh, support. And oh, here. Um, first of all, you know, just, just acknowledging, like I mentioned, I'm coming to you from the traditional unceded territories of the Tsleil-Waututh people and just acknowledging the Indigenous lands on, on which uh, you are uh, and the work that you do and feel free to share that uh, in the chat so everybody knows where everyone's coming from. I think that that's a, that's a great thing to do. 
a bit of who we are. Um, the First Nations Technology Council, we're an Indigenous-led not-for-profit working towards equitable access to technology for Indigenous communities in order to advance sovereignty in the digital age. Uh, our mandates come directly from First Nations Leadership Council here in British Columbia. There's 203 uh, communities here in British Columbia, but there's over 500 um, uh, Indian reserves, as they're called. So we've got a lot of communities uh, here in BC, a lot of chiefs, a lot of organizing to do around how to get infrastructure into each of those communities and skills into all of those communities. So these are our mandates given to us by the First Nations Leadership Council. And our vision and mission is to ensure that all Indigenous peoples obviously have access to digital and connected technologies. We do a lot of work in advancing digital skills development that's community led and designed. This is where a lot of our fundraising uh, comes in. And, and we're really passionate about sure, ensuring that Indigenous peoples are leading um, research data and analysis so that technology is not thought of as something that you know, we're waiting for industry or government to solution for us, but rather we're taking the lead on designing how we want technology in our communities and in our lives and in lots of cases in our bodies. It's really important, obviously, for Indigenous peoples to um, have uh, self-determination uh, for communities and how we uh, and how we want to interact with with uh, all the technologies that are available to us, and of course we're very passionate about um, uh, indigenous wisdom being present at the leadership tables as we design uh, the digital and virtual um, future. So a little bit about what we're what we're doing specifically. Um, we're trying to uh, draft and get funding currently uh, for Canada's first Indigenous framework for innovation and technology. Uh, we're leading our province's first sector labor market study in technology and innovation. And to do all of this, there's no data, really, uh, reliable data in British Columbia about connectivity skills development or the future of uh, skills in First Nations uh, communities as it relates to the economic trajectory, uh, you know, in terms of being more technology reliant. Um, so we're collecting a lot of that data and leading discussions on how to co-create a more equitable Canada. And um, the digital skills programming that we do is really at the heart of our work. So we've offered programming somewhere just over 3,000 Indigenous people in the province um, are programming, which uh, is called Foundations in Futures in innovation and technology. So our programming, Foundations and Futures in Innovation and Technology, one of the, one of the most important things about it is that we normally offer it face-to-face uh, -face and online. So there's a bit of a blended model. Uh, of course, now we're 100% virtual. And you can imagine part of the issue of us trying to offer all of our programming virtually is that uh, around 75% of First Nations communities in BC don't have uh, uh, broadband uh, high-speed access to their community. And less than 10% of First Nations homes in BC um, have access to the internet. Uh, this is for a bunch of reasons. Even the ones that do have access, there's uh, extreme affordability issues and there might not be hardware in the home as well. Or there might be you know, a family uh, sharing um, one or two devices. So obviously programming like ours becomes uh, challenged in this kind of environment where we're lacking, we're lacking basic access. So we're building this Indigenous framework for innovation and technology. Basically what we are understanding at the Tech Council is there needs to be a collaborative approach, something very comprehensive that's Indigenous led. And that's what this framework is really all about. So what the outcomes of this blueprint really are is to achieve these six goals. Uh, ultimately, our biggest challenge is neither industry or government necessarily want to fund um, not-for-profit organizations like us or this kind of work that is challenging the status quo and the current structure. So it is this interesting thing of, you know, the, the government, is, not necessarily going to fund the revolution here. So we have to find ways um, to survive as a not-for-profit organization to serve our mandates 
But I can tell you currently, the First Nations Technology Council does not have core funding. So really, we're running off of the administration, the, the two to five to 10% if you're lucky, um, admin fee that you put on any of the programs that you do end up uh, landing through contribution agreements through government. So that's really how we're surviving. We're using those funds to actually uh, shape this work that is much more transformational for our, our organization. So we've begun drafting uh, what this means for our communities. And I'm hoping that you know, this kind of rings some bells with others around the table too, where you know, this uh, access to, to technology is not just about the infrastructure. I mean, it is one big hurdle. Affordability is one big hurdle. Um, but this is really about, like I say, community development. This is really about Indigenous people having a unified vision for how technology is going to um, you know, shape our lives and future generations. So because it's an underpinning of almost everything we do in life, that scale and scope conversation becomes really challenging. And this is why we're wanting to, to build uh, a framework to begin to articulate that. Obviously, we can understand, uh, you know, if you look at the very bottom here, this, this broadband connectivity to the community, we see all the positive outcomes in the community. Uh, and so, you know, it, it's, it's um, not lost on us the ways that uh, access to technology can accelerate, uh, you know, a number of um, initiatives that lead to healthy, thriving communities. So just from our humble position, we just wanted to share a few things that um, I've done at the First Nations Technology Council that my team has done to try to mobilize what uh, I tried to do a very fast overview of there, which is uh, the work that we're trying to do at the local level, at the provincial level, at the federal level, um, with little to no resources. <laughs> so <clears throat> one of the places that we felt was really um, helpful that scale scope conversation was always really difficult for us as a not-for-profit because we're sort of expected to do everything. Um, so knowing what we do and knowing how um, to, to tell that story to different audiences was one of the most important things um, that we ever embarked on. And that can sound maybe kind of simplistic. It's actually really hard to do. Um, so knowing what uh, environment you're in, whether it's speaking with government, industry, academia, philanthropic circles, uh, to your communities uh, and to individuals who may become allies, <coughs> excuse me, it's really important um, to demonstrate uh, what you do exemplary well and, and really be able to celebrate that, which, you know, from my culture and, um, you know, community I come from, it's not always uh, something we're taught from a young age is how to really kind of shine the light on ourselves and how to tell the story um, uh, uh, of how valuable and important our organization is and how important we are and our leadership is in that space. So I think being really comfortable and that is important. Knowing the vision, mission, and objectives um, I think is really important and I think the next important thing is knowing where to negotiate and where are you willing to move because as you're speaking, seeking funding, seeking support, um, there is this question about how you align with the mandates um, of government or the interests of business. And that can be really difficult. I know it was difficult for me because I can be a bit stubborn and I wanted to see things reflected in documents or in programs as I wanted them to be. Um, but knowing where you're open to negotiating, not on your vision or your mission, but perhaps the how you get there is something that um, you know it can be helpful when you're trying to to co-create funding sources and i think you know to find a way to stay in a state of focus and clarity um, while also demonstrating the ability to stay committed to renewal and growth is something that we've found really challenging as a not-for-profit but absolutely fundamental to building um, um, support and and getting funding uh, across different programs so you know, we're, we're very hyper-focused on our skills development work. We've got six modules that we built uh, that we know are really important to Indigenous people to, to keep moving forward. Um, you know, we're being asked by different levels of government and industry to add new modules, which perhaps were not on our priority list, but will be funded if we move ahead with them. So it's this thing of, you know, how to work in partnership, um, 
with the these larger players in the ecosystem without compromising your own integrity, the vision of the community, and the direction that people want you to, to, to move in. And then understanding, you know, I've always used this language uh, at the Tech Council to support the development of our initiatives, knowing what's really core to what you do. You have the resources, you do it well. What's adjacent, so what kind of adds on to that programming? And then what are the big transformational things that you want to do in your organization? I think this goes back to your audience question, depending on who you're speaking with, sometimes telling you know, um, a deputy minister or a minister a really inspiring story about your vision in terms of the transformational work you'd like to do. Sometimes it's a really strategic thing to do uh, to get them really excited. And then when your ask comes to the table and it's actually just to fund this part of it, sometimes that can be an easier, <laughs> an easier yes. So there's definitely some, some strategy around that. Um, and just kind of last points, I, I think, you know, um, being, being, an, being an influencer uh, around tables has been probably the, the number one way I've attracted money to our organization, just to be blunt and frank about it. <laughs> um, so, you know, understanding where decisions get made, who are the ministers, what are the mandates, if you're talking from government, who are the big players in industry and who's kind of organizing um, from where you are, uh, you know, all the players in the industry, getting to know where those tables are, who's around them, what they're talking about, and getting in there as an advisor or getting on a board, that has been probably the most effective thing for me over the last five years, uh, because you need that insider knowledge of uh, what, what is being prioritized and how it's being mobilized. The other thing is, as Indigenous people, it's really important we're at those tables to give that input. And even if we're not being asked, you know, we have to put ourselves there. And so, you know, I think it's important to always step into those conversations. Um, this is a new practice for me that I've actually found has attracted um, both support for our organization and resources. I give feedback on absolutely everything that I'm part of, um, solicited or not. <laughs> so if I'm part of if I'm part of a conference or I attended a roundtable or um, somebody asked me to be on an advisory, I will give feedback on the process. I'll give feedback on what I thought worked and what I thought didn't. This sounds really time consuming. It is, but the thing is. Uh, what happens is the next time folks around these tables think of, you know, who can help build a better process, who can give us insight that's going to serve the Indigenous community, um, I appreciate getting that phone call. So for me, it's a little bit of that front end work to demonstrate that uh, our organization and our leadership is absolutely capable of transforming and walking alongside you on that learning journey. Um, so like I say, I think knowing how to influence people around the table. This is kind of a personal thing for me, so I don't know if it's gonna resonate with you, but um, when I was uh, you know, sitting at tables where decision makers and policy makers um, you know, were, were making decisions, I was finding it really hard to get in the conversation. Um, I was finding it difficult to influence the, the flow of the conversation, and I felt like I was always trying to catch up. Um, so I think it's really, important um, to figure out how to do that work in the background to build trust to get support it's a little bit of politics there you know figuring out how to how to make space for yourself at those tables so that people see you not as someone who's just dropping issues on the table time and time again but someone who's obviously working across um, across organizations and individuals to lift up messages in the best way um, this has been really instrumental for me over the years because it's actually how I've moved forward ideas um, that later become programs that later we apply to. So it is that thing of, you know, to influence the funding environment, sometimes you've got to get at that, at that, into that group so that, you know, it kind of serves you and your organizations later. Um, and then the last point is, you know, we've really worked hard at being a thinking partner. So, you know, whenever um, government, industry, academia, or philanthropic circles are thinking about how do we better serve Indigenous peoples or get more Indigenous peoples into 
um, into, our, into our programs or taking advantage of our resources. Um, again, I like to be one of the first people that get that call about how to think through how that might go. How do we open up our proposal process? How do we better scrutinize how our adjudication committees? Um, so of course, influencing there um, can actually mean success for you and your organization later. Uh, so that's been a huge, that's been a huge lesson learned. And then my very last point, we've always worked with elders and I think it's really important to remember, of course, that you know, we're carrying forward, um, you know, the, the, the lessons and the wisdom from um, generations um, before us. And so, you know, I think it's really important to remember, uh, of course, um, you know, the, the values um, and the integrity and, uh, you know, the, the paths that have been created for us to do this work in a good way. And I think, um, you know, standing standing in recognition of um, our ancestors and on the traditional territories that we are, you know, the, the power that that, um, that gives us and the resilience it gives us to, to keep going and to keep pursuing, um, you know, these resources for our people um, uh, in, in the best way possible. So that's all from us. Um, I just wanted to offer a few, few thoughts there. And if you wanted to reach out, there's all of our uh, contact information and I'll pass it over. Thanks everyone. Thank you so much, Denise. I really appreciate that. That was a great presentation and um, I'll pause here. Do you guys want to do questions in between? Does that work for you? Okay, so let's take a second then and turn to the chat. And please, if you have a question, ideally you would go ahead and unmute yourself and ask it live. That would be awesome to have sort of a discussion. But if you are nervous, you are welcome to put it in the chat or to message it to me separately and I'll ask it for you. So we'll give it like 30 seconds for questions. <laughs> Someone to post their question. Maybe I can ask a question. I'm Kathy. Hi. Um, are there other organizations like yours? You're, you seem to uh, represent uh, BC specifically, but are there other organizations like yours and what are they? <laughs> yeah, um, uh, we're, we're a bit unique um, in Canada in that our mandates are quite broad. Um, so in terms of everything from connectivity to skills development programming, advocacy around policy and uh, I mean, there's, um, we're not aware of any other uh, organizations in Canada that have that broad of a mandate that are Indigenous led, focusing on Indigenous communities. Um, but there are certainly are a number of organizations um, across Canada that are working on one of those or, or a couple of those things um, specifically. So yeah, for sure. I can, um, and I'm happy to sort of post um, some good friends, of course, how I entered into the circle, the First Mile Connectivity Consortium. There's a number of um, organizations associated with that that do similar work. So I'm happy to post that so you can see the list of the partners. So I have a question kind of going off that one for Denise. Um, I'm just look, curious about kind of how you came to this world and it sounds like the consortium was the maybe the first big event that you attended but can you give us a little bit of your superhero origin story of just how you got into this space? Oh gosh well, well thanks for the question yeah um, I actually come from a logging camp I was raised uh, in forestry in Haida Gwaii which is kind of close to Alaska um, so I was raised with like no access to uh, any technology, uh, even the phone in our house. So when I was a kid, I definitely had the memory of the very first time I was exposed to, oh my gosh, we can learn everything, you know, in, in one place. You just ask this question and you can find out the world's information. It kind of changed the trajectory, I'd say, of my entire life, <laughs> you know, um, just knowing that's possible. But this actually really found me. I started out an English teacher and um, 
you know, ended up meeting somebody, uh, you know, that uh, helped me in my career just to kind of find my way to this work of Indigenous education, self-determination, sovereignty work. And just by nature of being one of the younger people in the crowd, everyone was always asking me how to do tech stuff. Like, how do I fix this PowerPoint? How do I, you know, whatever. Um, I didn't really set out to do this. I have an MBA, um, but it is, um, you know, it's just been this, this, um, you know, thing of being able to convene conversations and inspire people to want to do something about it and being one of the louder people on this issue, because this to me is one of the foundational things we need to solve in our generation, because it's outrageous to me that people don't have access to the internet right now. So I think, you know, it's, it's just that, it's just that desire to, to, to kind of get this over the finish line so future generations can can focus on something more interesting like indigenous wisdom in AI or machine learning, you know? So yeah, it's a, uh, it, it was not intentional <laughs> as all good things are. And Denise, you've got a couple of questions. Cool. In the okay. Yeah. And I don't want to take up too much space here. Um, uh, is there anything thought about expanding the First Nations technology beyond BC? Yeah, we have thought a bit about that. Um, you know, obviously um, the chiefs that I uh, report to um, are mindful that BC is lagging behind in connectivity um, behind every other province. Um, so, you know, we really want to stay focused here um, for now, and I'll just say too, and I mean, this won't be a surprise to lots of people on the call, uh, all the good work the Tech Council's done, everything we've lifted, um, all of our agreements come to an end March 31st, and we have no funding. So the Technology Council might actually not exist after March 31st, 2021. Um, so all my effort at the moment is pushing to try to get funding to survive, but we're gonna have to start letting go of our staff in four months. So that's probably the biggest challenge I have right now. But if that was not the case, we'd actually be looking at expansion for sure and how we can support more nationally. Um, additional uh, equity uh, declaration, we have done um, a bunch of policy work around this and we've actually just mapped all of the work of uh, technology, access to technology and the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. I'm happy to share that if that's of interest, just to make the point that technology underpins our ability to implement and act on UNDRIP at every level. So that's, that's a lot of the work that uh, we've been doing over the last couple months. Thanks everyone, really great questions. I really appreciate um, the time. All right, thank you so much everyone for asking those questions. And Denise, thank you so much for answering them. I thought those are really insightful answers. And I think at this point, we're gonna turn it over to Crystal for her presentation. Thank you, Katie. Uh, and thank you, Denise, that was a great presentation. Um, I'm, actually, I'm actually just a, a little bit southwest of where Denise is located. So um, I will start to share my screen. Um, so as, um, as Katie had mentioned, um, my name is, um, Crystal Hodway and I've actually been introducing myself wrong. Well, not the way that I've been taught to introduce myself. So, um, my aunt has found out that I need, that I'm needing to correct this. So, uh, my name is Dutis Kwisaf. I am a citizen of the Kodichti Ak Nation, uh, and I come from the house of Tayishtid and Wai Bashta. Um, in English, I'm letting you know my name is Crystal Hodway. I told you my name, and um, it was my mother's name that was passed to me. Um, and I told you where I'm from and the family I come from. Um, and there's two reasons that I tell you that I introduced myself like that. One is for you to know where I come from, um, actually three reasons. For you to know, um, for you to know uh, who I who I come from, if there is anything that you need to um, talk to someone about about how I've interacted with you, whether it's good or bad. And then, lastly, I introduce myself like that to, as a reminder to myself of who I'm representing. So, 
<clears throat> I'm here to talk to you about the community access project for the Macaw Tribe. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar, the Macaw Tribe, actually, the Macaw Tribe is located in Washington State, so we're and we're on the very tip of the state. Um, you can't go any further north or any further west than us. Um, you'd fall into the Pacific Ocean. Um, so that means that we are very rural, we're very remote. There's one road in, one road out. We're small. Um, we have a, a tribal population of 3,000. Uh, we have about 1,500 people that live on the reservation and mo uh, there's some that are not tribal res um, tribal members who live on the res. So um, it's, a, it's a very small, um, out of the way. Um, I, I know that Danae was on earlier and, and um, I love to quote her. Um, you don't end up in Nia Bay by accident. And so uh, if you end up where I am, I am, it's because you intended to be there. So with that said, it makes it really difficult to um, present a compelling business case to your traditional telecoms. Um, we don't have a big population. We're not in a metropolitan area. And we are um, not, I mean, we're not, we don't have huge resources at, at our disposal. Um, and also as a, as a, um, a result of us being so far and remote and um, we've developed this very big self-reliancy. We will do it by ourselves for ourselves. We will take care of ourselves because we know that um, help isn't going to be coming very soon. So what we, what I want, what I'm here to talk to you about is one, my, my tribal project, um, but also how I, I was able to get funding for it and, and how I was able to leverage different sources. So um, the, the um, background that I want to um, bring to your attention about my project is that, um, you know, first of all, it, um, like I said, traditional telecoms, they were, they're, they're not interested in, in expanding their services um, or infrastructure for our use. Um, and so that made, that made it really important that we do this. The other thing that happened um, is that there was a Washington State Office of Student Instruction, or school instruction, public school instruction, um, they issued a, an, um, a regulation, all state mandated tests have to be conducted by a broadband link. And this is so that they can get a, a more individualized um, lesson plan. And, and it's great, it's a really good tool if everyone has broadband, which we know not everyone does. So we were in the, we were, um, we were forced to um, decide, are we going to build our infrastructure or, or are we going to bus our entire school 40 miles down the road on hairpin curves um, so that they can take their tests at the nearest uh, broadband location? That wasn't acceptable. So it was, we needed to, in, uh, to build out our infrastructure. So we did that back in 2014 and we opened up, we um, constructed a network for our government and for our school use. We weren't able to open it up to um, private use yet um, because we needed to be able to develop the business case. Um, so we were working on that. We, we knew we were on that way. Um, and in the meantime, what we had done is we looked at different grants um, and we were like, you know, there's some opportunity here. So the, with the Tribal Homeland Security Grant, what we had done was we utilized that for a radio study. So my reservation, we're on about 3,000 square acres and we have a lot of different um, land mobile radio holes where there's no communication at all. So we're like, okay, let's look at our reservation. Let's, let's look at the strategic locations and look at where we might be able to put a tower. Is there a power in, in place nearby? Is there, just a lot of the logistics of um, developing that. So we were able to, it was a $20,000 um, radio survey that we had conducted that gave us strategic location. So it gave us a starting point on how we're going to be able to increase our infrastructure. The next one that we, um, I applied twice, I, I got funding twice. The first with um, the Washington State Department of Commerce Community Economic Revitalization Board. I feel bad for their staff, because that's a really big, big, uh, big um, 
sentence to say. Um, so the first one we did, we got a feasibility study and that came back pretty grim actually. Um, and so we're like, okay, now we know what we're not going to do. So let's figure out what we are going to do. Um, and then what we did with the, the second round was that we utilized, we were going to um, do some engineering for um, a fiber loop for all of our tribal administration. And that was going to be for our backbone, which would come in later for our community network. This was all pre-COVID. I just, I, I need to make sure to tell you that. The other thing that we did was that we had tribal investments. So we, in 2014, there was, uh, it was 486,000 that the tribe had um, invested into the network. Furthermore, um, at the beginning of this year, we had a fiber project that was earmarked to be um, paid for from tribal dollars as well. So there's multiple sources that I, I've been able to stack up a little bit as we got into COVID. So then what we had, then what happened with COVID? <laughs> um, so when we went into um, quarantine, before the chairman made the announcement, he, he called me and he said, you know, we need to figure out how we can open up this network. We have this network, we can, um, we can do probably about 500 meg symmetrical. Um, how can we get it to the people? What is the engineering that needs to be done for this? Yeah, no pressure, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> um, I wasn't sure how we were going to do it, but we were going to figure it out. Um, so there were a lot of different things that, that came into place, that came into play. Um, it, it was as if the stars aligned, actually, for a, a lot of this project. So um, what we did, first of all, was um, we repurposed the existing funds. So that fiber loop that I talked about with the, um, with the funding, the grant we got, we repurposed it. Um, I, I asked um, for permission to refocus the scope of work for that and focus it more on a engineering, a wireless network to go over the reservation utilizing 2.5 spectrum. Now this is really exciting because the 2.5 spectrum was, uh, it's not used a, a whole lot by many people. So there's not a whole lot of experience. So the, the it's cool because you come into it and my and all the engineers that I know are, are very skeptical of it until they see it in motion. And then they're like, wow, this is great. Um, so we utilize that and, and we're on all three channels with the 2.5 spectrum. Um, and so going into quarantine, we had to develop these strategies for our backbone reinforcement. Um, how, how are we going to construct it? Um, how are we going to fund this? How, who's going to pay for this? Um, and then the, the question of all questions is, so now you got it, what are you going to do with it? And how are you going to keep it? So it was, uh, you know, um, going in after we finished the design it, it was like okay so now we're, we're ready to go and fundraise and so now we're, we're having to look at and we're having to expand um i didn't go into my background um, but i am a grants writer that's my title um and I, I like to joke because and say it's actually means jane of all trades um because it does require you to know a lot about a lot um and so going into it um we needed to be able to fundraise we needed to be able, and we needed to be able to go beyond our scope that we focused on to begin with which was all state and federal funds um so that opened up the door to nonprofits and to foundation work and especially during in quarantine and working under the covid it, it makes it a lot easier to access different funding systems that you wouldn't have before and so we all we, we applied for a lot of grants we applied for nonprofit we applied for foundation um, there's federal and state funds in there too that we've applied for and we've applied them for different various reasons um, and I'll get into my strat my my grant writing strategy in a minute but um, the feasibility studies are, are super important and a really great place to start with. Um, then you can get into your equipment and labor and uh, additional costs after that. Um, so what I've noticed with federal funding issues, um, actually, I, I think I'm going to, I'm going to back up and go into my, um, my grant writing strategy that I've utilized. 
So when developing our network and, and really looking at what it is that we're trying to accomplish, what, what, is, what are our goals and objectives, um, it, it became quite clear that there is no funding agency that is going to fund all of it. It, it has to be broken down. And so we chunk it out. Um, we take, like, for example, the um, radio study that we utilized with the Tribal Homeland Security. While it was, you know, $20,000, um, it provided us a roadmap. It was the value that it brought to the project was much more than the dollar value that was attached to the invoice. Um, and, and so taking, looking at your, your project and, and the different goals and objectives to it, um, and chunking it out like that is effective. It makes it a lot longer of a process. It makes it a bit more tedious as far as um, program management and grant management for that matter, but it's a way to get it done. It's the strategy that has worked. Um, so going into the federal funding issues, what I found. Um, so I sat in on a, a conference call, I want to say back in July, June or July, and, and they were talking about these different um, federal funding uh, that's available, that was out, it, it was CARES Act money. Um, and th they were also then talking about the different um, existing um, grants that are there that broadband infrastructure could be utilized for. And that got me kind of, I was kind of um, frustrated. I was very frustrated with that because um, for my tribe, um, housing is a huge issue. Um, you know, we have multiple generations of families that are stacked up in single family homes. I mean, these homes were not designed to hold families the way that we're utilizing them for. Um, and so that means that there's a, there's a really great need for a lot of grants to be written for housing to address our housing issues. And with those grants, those ICDBGs, um, they're, they're limited. You know, there's there, you can only go up to $750,000. So as a grants writer, um, I'm faced with, and then I, I, I don't make the decision on my own. I, that's beyond my pay scale. But... Um, we're faced with this decision. We, we can't, it's an either or kind of situation where you have to apply. You're either gonna, um, if you're gonna go after broadband infrastructure funds, you're doing it at the cost of your housing infrastructure funds. And, and while they can be two of the same, if you have a very sound strategy, um, if your needs are immediate, then you're not gonna be able to really do some long-term planning and strategizing and reach those goals. Um, it's really frustrating the way that the um, the, the way that they're siloed, um, and the way that they have uh, specific targeted areas. And and don't get me wrong, I, I'm um, I'm very thankful and grateful that there is um, broadband opportunities out there, um, and that we are able to shoehorn them these projects these objectives into larger uh, grants however it, it makes it problematic because the programs are not cohesive they're, they don't um, they're not talking to each other there's no um, there's it's it's really difficult to um, be able to um, use the programs the way that you want to um, the other thing too is that the the limitations on the funding I, I mean i talked about that a little bit earlier and so it makes it really difficult um because you're in a position to where you're having to rob peter to pay paul and ultimately it leads to the multiple grant applications which again it, it's i mean this is what we're here for but it makes it, it an unnecessary challenge um in a in a project that's already extremely challenging to begin with so what i did was when i was looking uh, and talking thinking about my presentation um there is not one not one federal federally dedicated tribal broadband funding um system out there there, there it just does not exist um there was one tribal specific grant for broadband development, which was the Department of the Interior. Um, they did a feasibility study grant. Um, they were due back in May. 
there was a 40, I think it was a $40,000 cap, 40 or 50. Um, but that's the only one that is tribal specific. So there are other grants out there, right? There, there's, I mean, you know, you've got the USDA, you have EDA, you have HUD. Um, there are some actually now from FCC, but there are none that focus on tribal broadband development. Um, but there are, however, that does exist in the nonprofit and foundation worlds. Now there, there's a whole plethora of resources out there as far with the nonprofit and the foundations. Um, and I would love to be able to one day develop a, a, um, a resource guide for the nonprofits and foundations for um, Indian country because the amount is, it's overwhelming. Um, as far as the federal, so actually I'm gonna go back. Um, so this is for federal. Um, now it varies state to state. Um, my state, Washington state, um, it, it is pretty progressive. Um, the, the Washington Washington state does have a, a fairly good um, relationship with its tribes. So it does do a lot of work um, with the tribes to um, promote their different funding. Um, and their programs. Um, we also have a really good relationship with our congressional delegation. So they know, um, we make it a point that they know what our needs are as far as the federal um, legislation goes, which leads into this. So the Digital Res Act, um, I mean, it, it's super important. Um, I, I'm really excited for it. I, I don't know what the, what the chances are of it getting pushed through but uh, there's so many different things um, that it opens up and and what it um, can create and the the partnerships it's going to build as a result um, it, it's really exciting to think about but you know opening the spectrum um, and I was listening earlier today um, with the Department of Interior National Tribal Broadband um, Summit and I was listening to Jeffrey Blackwell talk about, um, you, you know, we, we, there is a need for spectrum that is not wireless, or there is need for capacity on tribal reservations that is not wireless. And I agree wholeheartedly. Um, I think that we need to build all of the infrastructure that we can in, in every mode that we can. Um, what really has me excited about the Tribal Reservations Act is the creation of the Tribal Broadband Fund. Um, and I mean, I'm sure you could tell I was, I was building up to that because there, there is a, such a definite need. Um, and I'm preaching to the choir here when I'm telling you that broadband isn't a luxury. It, it's as necessary uh, um, as running water, as electricity. And, and even those are items that are really um, need to be addressed more fully and more forcefully on in, in, in Indian country. Um, so, you know, again, with the state legislation and um, what it's able to do is, what I would like, what I would like Washington State to do is to create a very similar um, package to the Digital Reservations Act, but on a state um, state level. And so, you know, the equivalency and the policies um, for for the state, what I would really would like them to do is to um, allow, make a mechanism that allows tribes to obtain ETC status through state um, a little with a little bit more ease than through federal um, to be able to have access to those um, those subsidies from USAC, um, the E rate um libraries well i guess that's e-rate as well um health care uh, tribal health care fund um the lifeline program and um high cost um i think that those if we're talking about um tribally owned etcs those are going to be some areas where you, sustainability comes into play um and, and they will help that sustainability portion so if you're, you know, these are the funding <laughs> questions that, um, that I take into consideration when I'm developing a, a grant for communications, um, as well as what our goals and objectives are going to be. Um, so, you know, assessment, the team and the project, 
What do you have? What's your infrastructure that you currently have? What are you running? How are you running it? Who's, who's your backhaul supplier? Who's, your, who's taking care of your O&M? What are the different um, partnerships that you have in place? What are partnerships that you want in place? Um, what are your needs today, tomorrow, and next week? How do they all interact and play with each other? Um, you know, and then looking at how you can incorporate different, um, different strategies, you know, incorporating, you know, other internal programs. Um, I, I thought about it for when I was writing this, I thought about it. I thought about it. And, and the challenge was for me was to think of one department, one internal tribal department who would not need this. I couldn't think of one. This is, this is something for everyone. This is, everyone has skin in the game on this. Everyone will benefit from it. Everyone is losing out from not having it. Um, what programs are leverageable? How can you leverage uh, and where can you leverage? Um, and are there different, you know, what other internal programs have the same goal? And again, this goes back to what I was saying, you know, I mean, there's not one person who isn't going to win as a result of this being put into place. Um, strategize what tasks within your program can be broken down into its own pro project I mean that alone was a, a you know just looking at okay we're gonna connect people wirelessly and then going from there breaking it down into your different goals and objectives and that will help you develop your <laughs> grant writing uh, and your proposals um, you know and and my team what we one of the things that we always say is that you know we're, we're frustrated with where we are right now because we planned this step five steps ago so in our minds we're like why are we still here we should be five steps ahead again um and, and so strategizing and planning in into the future like that is beneficial but you also gotta <laughs> gotta take care of those details in front of you um, and then are there tasks that can be counted more than once? So this is really um, where my, my fiber, um, a small fiber project comes into play. So this was um, a small fiber project that is paid for out of tribal dollars and it's $157,000. And we're looking to where um, I can leverage that in multiple different grants um, so that it shows a partnership on multiple levels. Um, these are just some ideas. I mean, these are some of how I've been able to create my funding packages. Um, I mean, I'm not saying my way is the only way or it's not, I'm not even saying my way is the best way. Uh, I am saying my, my way has worked for me though. So with that said, <laughs> here is my information, my contact information. Should you want to reach out and, and talk with me some more? Um, I've also listed the, um, the boards and committees that I sit on um, statewide, regionally, and nationally. Um, these are the ones that are uh, specific to, um, to communications, it's, and it's not an exhaustive list. But these are just the ones that are relevant for this um, presentation. So with that, um, I can take any questions. Thank you so much, Crystal. That was a fantastic presentation and I learned a lot. Um, so I wanna turn it to our participants, similarly to how we asked Denise questions. If you have any questions you'd like to ask, it'd be great if you could just unmute yourself and ask them here. Um, or if you would prefer, or if you have audio issues, please feel free to put them in the chat or send them to me privately. Maybe I can go first again. Hi, I'm Kathy. Um, uh, and maybe you sort of covered this already, but what would you say, not as a grant writer, but for your whole project, was the most important first step to get going? Oh, wow. Um, the most important first step would be assessment. It would be to see what you have. What do you already have um, on hand? nearby and what is it that you need after that 
And I would say that for people and for equipment, infrastructure, all of that. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? You're also welcome to hold them till the end. That is easier. Okay. With that, thank you so much, Crystal. I'll turn it over to Wayne. Thanks so much, Katie, and thanks, Denise and Crystal. Um, and so I guess the, the journey that we're going from is from sort of the macro level of um, working on policy and, and working with communities to engage and change that policy uh, to improve at the community level. And then sort of a story from Crystal um, around how this might look in a particular community. Um, and uh, I'm joining you now from Takaronto on Turtle Island. And this is kind of dish with one spoon territory. Um, this is an agreement made between the Anishinaabe and the Mississaugas, the Haudenosaunee's, which is to share to protect this land. Um, recognizing that we all eat with one spoon from one bowl. Um, and I'm here to share a little bit more about maybe just one tool in your toolbox, given that um, this topic is about funding and community funding, but also recognizing the challenges of piecing together this puzzle of all the different funding sources and all the different needs of bringing your project to fruition. And the projects that I do have in mind for this are um, more on community-led internet service providers, right? So uh, the tool that I'd like to talk a bit about, and I'll share my screen, is something called a community bond. Um, and so for those who are less familiar with a community bond, um, this is one of the instruments or one of the tools within the world of repayable social finance investment. Um, so, so far what we've been talking about are grants, uh, which there are like lots of legitimate needs for. Um, but if we think about that sort of broader capital stack of our project, um, and if there is a plan for sustainability, most likely that plan includes some sort of revenue generation component. And if there's a revenue generation component, we can kind of use the tools available to social enterprise. Social enterprise be being sort of using business principles to achieve that social, environmental, cultural, economic impact. Um, and so a community bond is, is basically like a debt instrument. It's a loan. It's a mini term loan that you raise from stakeholders. It could be from within the community. It could be also allies of the community. Um, and this is available to nonprofits, co-ops, um, for-profit social enterprises, registered charities, um, um, bands, councils, and, and so forth. So it really is an instrument that is accessible by many different legal structures, depending on how you are uh, structured. Um, and how this works is that um, you'd basically run a campaign. It's something like the equivalent of a crowdfunding campaign, um, where you go into your network and you're saying, instead of raising donations or grants or sponsorship, um, you're actually saying, we want to ask you for investment into our project. And over a period of five years or 10 years or 25 years or whatever the term might be, we're going to pay you with interest. And so that's where that revenue generates. Um, so if you have your community led ISP um, and now you're presumably you know, charging some sort of small subscription fee, that's revenue that you can use towards repaying a repayable investment. Um, and so something like a community bond might be interesting. Um, and so this is an organization that I'm, so I'm not actually with Tapestry Capital, I should have mentioned I'm with McConnell Foundation. Um, but these are just a two different case studies that, that I'd like to share briefly about some of the, the work of community bonds towards furthering organizational missions in our sector. So Tapestry Capital are the experts in community bonds in, here in Canada. Um, they've done this for organizations doing social purpose real estate. Um, so building out co-working spaces, building out shared spaces like affordable housing. Um, and they've also done this for um, just different organizations, something like a, a rowing club. Um, they've done it for seniors uh, spaces. So it can be used for a multitude of different um, purposes. Um, but really it's the, the use cases when you have a need for financing where your regular annual operating budget may not suffice. 
Um, so you can spread the cost out of that asset or you can spread the cost out of the purchase of the equipment or the um, upfront costs of doing a feasibility study or the upfront costs of doing the, the radio study or, or what have you over a period of time and over the period that you would be generating revenue. Um, so this is one example, uh, a community bond. And this next example is in the US. Um, so for those who might be familiar, familiar with TechSoup in the US, well, it's a global organization. Um, TechSoup has multiple different pieces to it. It's best known for its marketplace where charities and nonprofits can go and kind of get discounted software and discounted hardware as well as IT services. Um, they raised a direct public offering so this is something like a community bond, but it's, it, it's, it's equivalent in uh, the US. Um, and so you can see they've basically got like a crowdfunding platform. Um, they've used the platform called Social Venture uh, Connection. And they've got three different instruments or three different doors to get into this tool. Um, so one is more, you know, for just community members, it's, it's, it's offering 2% uh, rate of return. Um, and I think the lowest amount that you can offer is something as low as $50, $50 um, through to 5% interest rate. And I think, um, I think that's like much higher. So that would be for say foundation endowments to invest or something like that. So those are just, I wanted to just share a couple different examples of organizations using repayable investment um, to think about complementing the grants or the donations or the sponsorships or the contribution agreements that might come from government agencies or nonprofits or other foundations. Um, hopefully it expands your, your toolbox a little bit. Um, and again, the, I think the key criteria for success here would be, could there be a revenue stream at the other side of this expense item? Um, and if so, then this tool might be applicable. So I'll, I'll close my slides for now. Um, and just see if there's other questions here. Thanks, Wayne. And all as with the other participants, please feel free, or the other speakers, please feel free to jump in and ask your questions or put them in the chat. I also just oh sorry did someone speak okay i was just gonna say really quickly i don't Katie, can you hear me sally no 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 okay. go ahead we can hear you Let's see, Sally, you are unmuted if you'd like to say, ask your question. Okay, can you hear me, Katie? Yes. Oh, wonderful, okay. Yeah, all right, I just wanted to ask Wayne, I, I didn't catch the first part of his presentation, but um, is uh, collateral requested? Yeah, excellent uh, question. Sorry, go ahead, I don't mean to cut you off. No, I, it's just, in, it's my experience uh, working that, um, with banks, et cetera, is that uh, uh, on reserve assets are not accepted as collateral. Yeah, no, no t completely understand. And it really depends. Um, I've seen projects that do offer collateral and I've seen others that do not. And it really is ultimately decided upon the appetite of the community or the stakeholders that you're engaging in this type of tool. Um, so, even just from a from a personal note, I've I've invested in some um, community bond structures in renewable energy, and there there's no collateral necessarily that I'm relying upon in case they were to get into the unfavorable position of a default. Um, but there are contracts for the revenue generation that comes from the energy produced, as well as there's some pretty high value you know, solar panels in case something were to go awry. And so, you know, for a community-led internet service provider, there would be tremendous amounts of equipment, there would be lots of um, knowledge, so all the, the radio studies, the feasibility studies, um, and so forth that could be picked up in case something were to go wrong, but obviously no one wants that to happen. So your, uh, the, the grant programs that you're offering, or the financing programs that you're offering, offering they accept uh, future receivables as collateral 
Exactly. Yeah, you can think of it that way. Yeah, uh, that would be using you know sort of like more technical accounting terms. Um, but exactly what you're thinking, it's it's you know the way to gauge if the investment would be viable would be let's map out the cash flows. Let's look at what your expenses are going to be and what those revenue potential is going to be. And because no one can predict the future, um, everyone will probably want to look at a few different scenarios. So maybe a best case scenario, a most likely scenario, and perhaps a worst case scenario if everything doesn't quite go in your favor. Um, and of all of those you know, check out, if all of those seem viable and reasonable, and you know, obviously there's going to be assumptions there. Um, but if those assumptions feel believable, then it would be a good investment opportunity. Thanks, Sally, for your question. And Wayne, you've got another in the chat from Wayne Kelly, who asks, can you describe more how these options can coordinate with community foundation funds? Yeah, excellent question. And, and I guess uh, for the Canadians on the call, um, there's a few different initiatives from the federal government of Canada that very much align with this idea of community bond. Um, and those are through Employment and Social Development Canada. Um, the first is called the Social Finance Fund, which is a $755 million Canadian um, initiative to really seed the space of uh, repayable social finance. Um, that, that money hasn't started to flow yet, but uh, it's still in legal design for all the, the funding structures, um, but we do expect that to be accelerated over time. If you, there's a C CBC article that's uh, gone public to that effect as well. And when I'm in touch with the SDC folks, um, they do reiterate the point that it's it's still a very much uh, committed program. Um, they've just been obviously sidelined by, by COVID as, as, as many of us. Um, and then the second initiative that I'll just put on the investment readiness program, and um, that's perhaps what you're referring to with the community foundation funds. So Community Foundations of Canada is one of the uh, five administration parties to this investment readiness uh, uh, program. Um, and for an organization that is perhaps considering a community bond or any other loan or equity investment into a, a project, and that project can be uh, a varied different purposes now, um, if you're looking to build out a business plan or do a feasibility study or do a market analysis or do some sort of operational feasibility uh, or uh, look at financial modeling or building out your internal systems and processes or any number of different things, the list could go on. It's, that's not comprehensive by any means. Um, this investment readiness program might be right for you. Um, I, I like to paint this kind of visual where if you're looking to access investment, um, and you've got some walls in your way, you can use the investment readiness program to help you knock down those walls. Um, and so it's a non-repayable fund, it's grants that you can use to sort of circumvent your way to get access to that repayable investment. Thanks, Wayne. Um, Chris Mitchell, I also saw you have another example in the chat and I'm wondering if you'd like to say a little bit about that for those who aren't, don't have access to the chat. Sure. Um, a community network in Vermont used a bond like this um, that was more or less privately issued and mostly supported by local folks that really wanted to support it. Um, it raised millions of dollars to help start a fiber network that has grown substantially um, in part because of the level of risk that there was no backing for it and it was a fairly risky proposition. They were paying, I think it was more than 9% interest. Uh, which is quite significant and was certainly at the time it was issued when um, interest rates were at that time historically low. Um, so uh, it, it, I don't know that it would have succeeded absent a few people who were quite wealthy in the area um, and able to snatch those up in order to make sure that their neighborhoods were connected in, in an area that um, had probably some people who were working in Vermont from New York um, and that sort of a thing. Um, but uh, it is a um, it is helpful, I think, to know that this has been done before, at least, and we can keep improving upon it and iterating on it to make it better. But it's a good way to tap into um, proceeds uh, and, and potentially some wealth locally. Um, and the other thing I would say is that I feel like a lot of people, um, when they're thinking about these bonds, they're trying to figure out how to make them non-taxable uh, because we have an inherent bias to thinking that would make them more valuable. 
but non-taxable bonds, and I could be speaking out of school, anyone could correct me, but my understanding is non-taxable bonds are more complicated for people like us that aren't very wealthy. If we wanted to support a community project, it'd probably just be easier to use taxable bonds. Um, and so you can avoid headaches in some ways by, um, by going down that route. So um, I, I think, in my impression is a lot of people have the sense that untaxable bonds, non-taxable bonds are better, but that may not be true for the audience that you're working with. Thanks, Chris. Um, and Kyle in the chat also said that some of his project's funding comes from the CRTC Broadband Fund. And um, that's a really good link to point to as well, that there are that kind of funding opportunities available. Kyle, I don't know if you wanna say a couple words about that as well. I also can't tell if I'm frozen. No, okay, good, thanks. Okay, Kyle, sorry to put you on the spot then, no worries. Um, does anyone else have any questions for our speakers? Okay, going once, going twice. All right, then with that, I wanna say a huge thank you to our speakers for today and to everyone for your participation. We can go ahead and wrap up a little bit early and give you some of your time back. Again, I know that there are competing um, summits this week. So one last time, I'll just say before we go, if you miss any of these sessions, please be sure to watch them on the participant website ahead of time and send me an email saying that you've done that so that I can make sure you get your certification during the Indigenous Connectivity Summit. And if you've not signed up for the summit itself, which is taking place in two weeks, please be sure to do that um, as soon as possible so that you can join us there. We're gonna have a track during the summit to come up with a set of policy recommendations and we'd really like the alumni of this group to help lead some of that work. Um, and I can talk a little bit more about this next week, but one of the th this is something we've done every year we've had the summit. We had some Indigenous Connectivity Summit policy advisors last year that really took the lead role in doing that and we'll have the same this year. And essentially this is an opportunity for those of you who've gone through the training and now understand a little bit more about what sort of policies could impact your ability to get connected, um, as well as sort of how to advocate for better policies to set the agenda, not only for the Internet Society, but for the other participants of the Indigenous Connectivity T Summit and tell us what are the policies and advocacies that we should all collectively be advocating for and working towards in 2021. So, Keep that in mind, register for the summit, and I'm really looking forward to seeing you all again next week. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye, everyone. Bye, everybody. Great, great presentations.